So welcome back to the shop, friends. I have a very exciting video for you today that you're not going to want to miss because if you don't watch this video, you'll never find out what is inside this little blue box. Just one look, and I felt so hot. So friends, you're in for a treat today. This is something I never thought that I would see. I never thought that I would see in person. I mean, I've of course seen them on the websites and for sale, but it was just always a little bit out of my reach. And I am so thrilled uh, to, <laughs> actually I knew what it was. So just quickly, before we open this up. So this, this was sent, um, this tool set was sent um, from my uh, friend, Ken, uh, who, as you remember, he sends, he's a very generous man. He sends things all the time. And he sends um, really obscure tools trying to stump me, uh, and he puts the answer in an envelope here. But I did take a peek at this, and I actually knew what this one was. So without further ado, are you ready to see? Look at that. Can we focus there? Give me a focus on there. How many of you know what that is? That is the very, very rare and hard to find what was it, the Stanley? Stanley, I forget the number, 62, 63, I wrote it down here. Stan 96, the Stanley 96. You thought that number one plane that I had was small. Let me bring that out here for you, that we restored their, their last year. You know, that was, that's a pretty small plane right there, right? But how about this one? <laughs> that's, a, that's taking small to a whole new level. So how many of you guys actually know what this is? Let me, let me bring you in a little bit closer here. All right, here we go. What better backdrop could we have than the an original Stanley Yellow box or Stanley Yellow color? Look at that! Isn't that beautiful? So this is a Stanley number no. six ninety six chisel plane. This is very very old. Uh, I did a little research on this before the video, and from what I uh, what I gathered, this was produced. It, it was originally introduced to Stanley in eighteen eighty eight, and was produced up to 1922, and that's when it went out of production. Now, the earlier ones will, will have, I think, the, the memory serves, had a patent number on it, and the later ones did not. So, not, see, oh, there it is. It is, this is, this is one of the old ones. So when I, when I looked at this in my office where the light wasn't very good, I was assuming this was on the tail end, the 1900s or so, but being this has a patent number on it, if, if I could be wrong, but I believe this must be one of the very first ones, the original ones, built in the 1800s. Can you believe that? That's something else to have something like this that was, that's uh, still functional in such wonderful condition. Look at the nickel on it. That's one thing that makes the, Stan the old Stanley tools so beautiful and so interesting to me is that, that that nickel finish. I prefer that nickel finish over chrome any day. It has a, a richness to it that is just, it's just exquisite, just beautiful. No rust on it, no marks damage from screws on, on there. There's a little bit of the nickel you can see coming off there on the tip, but this is quite something, isn't it? That is absolutely beautiful. But it doesn't end with this because this is only half of the of the combo here, this would it is uh, to be complete. You would have to have one more piece, and believe it or not, we've got it. And it looks to me, from the pictures that I could tell, it might even be the original one. And this is the quarter inch chisel or gouge. Look at that. That is old. Look at the facets right there, and you know look. It has that appearance of being. Handmade, who knows, brass ferrule and a hardwood handle with still has the original varnish on it. Is that not gorgeous or what? How about that to have the original set together? You wonder, makes you just wonder how, how, it, how it came, to, how, how did it get here? How many hands have it, has it passed through and, and how fortunate it was to have um, people that recognized its, its value, intrinsic value and and uh, looked after it and, and took care of it. Many, many, many people. Isn't that something? So before I can show you what it's for, we need to sharpen it because this is, um, this is in bad shape. And I think this might just be the perfect job for the Russian knife sharpener. The nature of the task that this chisel needs to do, or this combination, this chisel plane, uh, is, uh, is very critical. And the angle, um, from what I've read, is 
is very important. Now this is gonna be, we're gonna need to sharpen this at a very different angle than we would a traditional chisel that's going to be between you know, 25 and 30 degrees. This needs to be 15 degrees. You'll find out here why in a minute. So let's put this uh, up, put the jig together here, and then we'll, uh, we'll see if we can't get that angle perfect on there. So this is certainly a little unorthodox, uh, but I, I'm not set up to, to file or, or to sharpen the chisel at 15 degrees. All my jigs and everything are for more the traditional 13 or 30 to 25. So this may or may not work, but I think that it will. So even though it's held at an angle, we should be able to, to get that. Because I, I want to get that exact 15 degrees, and, and I don't know if, of another way to do it uh, quickly and easily. Uh, so this is what I come up with. So let's set our, our, set our angles and then um, see if we can uh, put a nice edge on this. The angle cube is the best, absolutely the best thing ever. Okay, so we'll put that on there. And so the, we'll, we'll zero out the base right here. And so we'll uh, calibrate, zero that out. Now we can dial in our 15. I've got the coarse stone installed there. And so we'll sit right, right there where the stone is gonna cross the, the chisel. And we're, uh, what we're looking for is, of course, our 15 degrees, according to the, uh, what I read. So we'll dial that down. That's a really shallow, oops, that's the lock over there, really shallow depth there. So we'll, there's a gross adjustment and then there's a fine adjustment. So we'll, I'll run the gross one down till I'm close. Then I can lock that off. Then we can use our fine. Little, we're almost there. Now would be a good time to click the thumbs up while you're waiting for me to set this up here. I really appreciate that. Helps the channel. That's it, lock it down. I think we're ready. I'm curious to find out what the angle is now, you know, what it, what it came with. Um, we'll see here. So I've got the core stone on here. A little bit cramped here with the tripod in the way, but I guess it's, it's easier to have a tripod in my way in this little shop than have one million of you all in here. That, that would be very crowded. So I've got the 15 degrees established there. Actually, it was pretty, pretty close. I, I didn't have to take too much off of there, but that is just, that's just, Read, I guess, redetermine that angle. Now we'll take it over to the diamond stones and we'll finish this off by hand now that we've got this established. And I can, I, what, I, what, what, I don't mind sharpening these by hand, but I, I kind of needed to get a baseline there first uh, that we could work off of. When you're sharpening these chisels like this, always the first thing you want to do is after you've established that angle is to flatten that back. That's the most important. You only have to do that once, and you know it's flat when it's when it has a nice polish like that on it, and it's even all the way across. So I just went coarse, fine, and super fine on there. So on the coarse one. So now that we've got the angle determined, I can kind of we can kind of uh, tip it up there and f and feel it, and start the polish. Nothing finishes off metal like leather. This is just some rawhide, and some polishing compound on there, a very super, super fine abrasive compound. And then we can uh, just go backwards. Angle's not important, just go more than your 15. I press as hard as I can. There you should be able to see that, that polish on there. See how it's a mirror-like, it's a mirror-like finish on the, on the tip of that from that, uh, that leather strop, isn't that beautiful? That is really sharp. That's a quarter inch chisel. Here's the back side. you can see, flat. Now we're ready to assemble everything here. So I haven't done this before, I, I, so we're, we're learning together. I'm just kind of going off of what seems to be reasonable. So this is, uh, is going to be, this, this is be a guide. We don't want to damage our edge. We put all that time into it. This is going to be a guide for our chisel, and it's gonna turn it into just like a little mini, a mini um, plane 
right there for a very specific task. Now we'll probably have to go back and, and readjust this a time or two to get it right. I can feel it's grabbing. I might have it a little bit deep there. Let me back it up a little, just a tiny, tiny bit. If we put it on the wood, we'd be able to feel. Yeah, okay. Let's start with that and I'll, let's, uh, I'll show you what it's for. So what this little Stanley 96 is for is for a technique that I've never done before, but it's called blind nailing or bl uh, putting in a blind nail. So what I have here is I've got a piece of uh, CVG fur, a tread. So let's say, for example, that you had a, a squeaky tread uh, on, on some stairs that uh, was maybe very old or super high end work that you, you just, you didn't want, you couldn't get to it. You didn't want to put, drive a nail through the top of it and ruin it, ruin the aesthetic. So from what I understand, there was a, there was a technique uh, that master carpenters would use called blind nailing. And we're, and we're going to try that right now. I'll show you the process. And so you, if the depth was set right, and I don't know if it is, but we'll, we'll try, but you would take this little, this little tool here and you would push it putting weight down and you would plane up a little piece of wood, just like that. You see that there? And very, very carefully, you would pull the tool out. And now this gives you kind of a, a little recess in there. And what you would do is you would drive a tiny nail or a screw, I guess, whatever you could get into here, into this area, and, and fix the secure something, or you know, maybe they used this, I don't know, maybe they used it in fine cabinetry where they needed to top nail something and they wanted to hide everything. And they would drive the nail down there and then countersink it. And then very carefully using a fish glue, a glue, something to do with, maybe it was made out of, obviously made out of fish. And they would use fish glue because it was super tacky. And, and as soon as it made contact, uh, it would go, it would, you would roll that back down there and you would hide that. Now we can try it with a little bit of uh, super glue, you know, just for effect. I don't have a, I don't have a tiny little nail right here, but I think you get the, the idea. But I think the idea was just, we'll just try it here. If we put a, a dollop of, is that going to work? Totally the wrong type of glue here, but this is just for demonstration. Oh, I got way too much on there. So this would be very finicky, fussy work. So you would probably take that, take that fish glue and, and coat, coat that whole area. And also, I think another thing with fish glue is it was, it's easy to clean up. This would not at all be the right thing to use. I'm, it's just a, it's just a test right there. And then you could take, um, you could take something, you know, maybe your finger or square, and you could, after that nail was installed, you could roll that down there like that. See, that's why the tacky glue would be so important where the, the super glue wouldn't work. But uh, you get the idea, right? How that, how that would work, how you would blind nail with that. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Now, the question uh, would, comes up uh, from, uh, uh, car, you know, if, if you are a master carpenter back in the day, do you need to have this guide? Um, or would you, <laughs> would you not have the ability as a master carpenter uh, to freehand a, uh, the same thing, which we'll try here like that, and, and do your blind nail as well. You can kind of see. Um, yeah, and actually, you know, the one that I did freehand, look how much, uh, see how much thicker it is? It's still thin enough where it, it will bend uh, but it's a little bit more substantial. It would probably be more durable. I would, I probably didn't have that set deep enough. If I were to do it again, I'd set it a tiny, tiny bit deeper. Um, but isn't that, isn't that cool? What a technique. Um, clever what those, those old carpenters came up with. That was the, you know what really, uh, was the difference between a, a master carpenter and a, and an apprentice or a new carpenter was uh, the master carpenter knows how to hide mistakes. <laughs> it's, it, that's a true, true to this day. You know, the better, the older we get, the better we are at hiding things. You know, we start to get a little overweight and, and we can hide it with clothing or we have some f physical defects that bother us. We can hide it with cosmetics. You know, it's like, it seems like that's what we're really good at is hiding things, isn't it? But I thought that was, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. I could see where that would definitely be a technique. And if done with care, done right, um, 
no one would ever know that it, that it was there. The Stanley 96 chisel gauge. That is, isn't that neat? That is really, that's very, very special. That, that has, um, that just brings me tremendous joy. Thank you so much, Ken, uh, for your generosity and uh, um, uh, for, for sending this to me. I, I don't know where you found it, where you got it, but uh, it will be, it will be treasured. Uh, it will absolutely be treasured. That is, that's really special to me. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the thumbs up if you enjoy these videos. And um, I guess that's it. We'll see you guys on the next one. So many of you have um, have written in the comments that you really enjoy the the end sequences or my take on different things or topics or anything that, that uh, suits my fancy to speak about. And I was I was thinking on that, like, what do I want to talk about this this afternoon? And then I was editing the video and... I was thinking how I was referring to cosmetics and then cosmos. You know, cosmos stands for uh, chaos. And uh, c cosmetics comes from that. It is uh, making order out of chaos. If, um, if you're like me and sometimes you wake up in the morning <laughs> and look in the mirror, you indeed look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, chaos. And a cosmetic is just the process of uh, bringing chaos into order. Um, and so I, that reminded me, you know, of um, of cosmetics. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, we used to attend this church, and they were very conservative, and they were um, very much against wearing uh, jewelry and cosmetics. And and I don't have a problem with that because uh, I, I prefer. I think women look more beautiful, not made up, or painted, how uh, too or overly overly made up. I, I think that the natural look is is much nicer. That's what attracts me to Mrs. W so much. Um, and so this church, uh, they were like-minded in that. And, um, and I remember a, a woman came in, um, that, uh, was off the street, um, had no background in, in uh, Christianity. I don't know if she'd ever been to a church before, uh, with, and she was wearing a fair amount of makeup. And, uh, a couple of the older women, the, you know, the old saints that have, that have been there forever, um, started, uh, uh, making an issue of this and, 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 and literally making her uncomfortable. And uh, I'll tell you what, there's something, there's a few things in life that I have zero patience for, and that's one of them. A self-righteous person um, is, to me, um, is, is, I can't take it. Um, I uh, have physically confronted, <laughs> not physically, uh, in public confronted uh, people who have uh, made, have done this um, to, to new people coming into a church. I think that is one of the most grievous sins. One of the worst things that someone can commit is by judging others by your standard. You know, the thing that gets my goat on that is that we're all at different levels. You know, I, imagine the, the, the journey to God as a ladder. Some people are on the bottom rung and some people may be in the middle and some on the top. And if you do find yourself on the top rung, um, don't judge someone on the bottom rung by your standards. Uh, that is, um, that's a horrible thing to do. Um, w j that person on the bottom rung is on the ladder just like you are. And just because you're on a rung above them doesn't mean that you're any better. You're all on a path. You're all on a journey. You're all trying to get to the same place. Remember that. Uh, remember that if you, you know, when you're looking at people, and this is just as, I'm, I'm not preaching to you guys. This is just as much for me as, as it is for you as a reminder that when we see other people that may not meet our so-called Christian standards, um, you keep your mouth shut. You worry about your own things. You worry about your own relationship and you be kind and you offer help. And if God lays it upon their heart uh, to raise them up to your level, then uh, that's his business and that's their business and it's none, none of yours. So, man, I didn't know that this was going to turn into a rant. Thanks for watching and we'll see you guys on the next video.